So happy Monday and happy Halloween. This is the low energy version of Bob today. I'm a little bit sick because of, uh, I think I got sick on the flight back to Wales on Saturday. So for anybody uh, with the cover sheets, just submit your coursework without the cover sheet because I forgot to put a cover sheet for the third year students. The master students didn't have any problem, but I don't remember about the cover sheet for the third year students. So, yeah. Another amazing piece of advice is if you send me email about a coursework, CC Richard Roberts, because Richard Roberts is even better than I am at answering questions about the courseworks. I thought we can't send him. Excuse me? I thought that we can't send him emails asking about the coursework. Really? Why not? I don't know. I thought we should ask you. I just assume. <laughs> no, no. It actually says on the syllabus you can send him email. It's got his email address. You could even make an appointment with him okay. if you want. Yeah, it says it on the syllabus. Any other? Questions about assignment one? You put it in a box. You can give it to me, but you, the official protocol is you're supposed to bring it to the student secretary, and she I think she scans it. So like you officially submitted it, and it's on record. Yeah, it's a very sophisticated submission system. I remember the old days when you give it to the the teacher. I actually don't know because it's moved around. He, the student secretary knows where it is, so she she can help you. Next to the Talbot lab, and theoretically, you got an email with all the information. Yeah, it's in one of your thousands of your emails. <laughs> But yeah, it's next to the Talbot lab, from what I understand. Another question? So there shouldn't be a problem with the scanning of coursework if you're third year students. Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just submit it without the cover sheet. I just tried to make a cover sheet now. But I'm getting some error messages. <laughs> I can't log in anymore. So, yeah, just submit it. You still, ha I still have the Blackboard submission, so you can say, "Oh, look on Blackboard, it says I submitted it on time," or something like that. But I'm not the kind of person that like has discussions and arguments about exact discussion uh, submission times. I'm not really like that. So don't don't sweat about it. Yeah. Some people are very concerned about being punctual, but I'm not that kind of person for the course works. If you say you submitted it on time, I, I will I won't believe you, but I'll I'll, I'll say fine. <laughs> no, I believe you. I'm sick, but I still have my sense of humor. <laughs> Any other questions about assignment one? I still have my psychic powers. I'm not so so ill that I can't read your minds. I know some of you are thinking, Bob, what about assignment two? <laughs> See? It's coming. It's coming, and you're going to love it. You're going to love it. It's even better than assignment one. By the way, the, the, the reason we're here, one of the reasons we're here is to get an education. So you might think, oh, these courseworks are not very easy. But when you look back, they're very educational, aren't they? Didn't you find assignment one to be very educational? You learn a lot. But the grades yeah. are important also. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the grades are important. You don't learn from assignments that are really easy, do you? No, not really. 
You learn from the difficult ones, I think. I can't think of an e well, I guess it is possible to have an easy one that you learn from. I guess it's possible. But usually it's the difficult ones you learn from. Any any other questions? Anybody surprised at how well I can read your minds? I have extra copies of the volume visualization, introduction of volume visualization lecture. If anybody needs one and wasn't here. Was anybody not here at the last last lecture? Okay, good. So we started the introduction of volume visualization. We had the exciting video last time. Everybody remembers that. And we talked about how volume visualization summarized in a sentence is how can we take this volumetric data and project it onto 2D space. That's the whole topic. There are lots and lots of different ways to do that. And that's what assignment two is about. So assignment two, if, if you want a preview, is here are some data sets, here are some tools. Now project this 3D volume data onto the 2D display in, different, in a few different ways. That's a, a summary of assignment two in a nutshell. It's a little bit more difficult than that. And we, there are lots of different sources of volume data. You've all already experienced volume visualization when you went to the hospital. Has anybody ever been to the hospital? For what? <laughs> For anything. If you had an ultrasound, I never had an ultrasound. But that's a volume visualization, actually. If you've had an x-ray, that's a volume visualization. If you, anybody ever have an MRI scan? I've never had that. That seems to be a very exciting option, though. That's another volume visualization. Yeah. Part of assignment two is to give your, your medical details <laughs> All your medical records. <clears throat> yes. So we went over this. This is the last slide I think we went over. And data in, in volumes is, is placed on cells or in voxels, which are volume elements, or tetrahedra which are small prisms, right? So these are the challenges, the big challenges for volume visualization. If you multiply 512 by 512 by 512 for a volume of voxels, for example, you get a large number that exceeds the display space, right? It, ex it exceeds the, the display space. So the question is, how do you handle that? So it's like you're trying to compress the 3D volume in some ways onto the 2D display. It's almost like a compression. But it's technically it's called a dimension reduction. So you're reducing the dimensionality of the data, which is 3D, onto 2D. So it's one less dimension. And the other question is, how can we do that fast? Is it possible to do that at, say, 5 or 10 or greater frames per second? <clears throat> does anybody remember or has, does anybody know how, how fast the human visual system can see? What frame rate we can, we can see the world at? 20-something. 20 20 20 something. That's correct. Well done. Well done. I mean, this is something that I think that the that millennials might be interested in, right? Like, if you produce a movie, 
it has to be at least 24 frames a second, right, when you go to the movies. I don't actually know what the frames per second is. I think on a typical TV, it's like 60 frames a second or something. But yeah, you have to have it at least that fast for a movie. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, that, that frame rate. So when we put data on in space, we have some different possibilities how we can arrange that data. These are really the same in many ways, right? Because this cube is just shifted by, by a half of a unit along each direction. So in some ways, these are the same. So this is a voxel, a picture of a voxel, or a volume element. And these, these are the data samples at the, at the extre extremities. And this is a cell, right, where the data is set at the corners of the cell. And we always interpolate to get the values of the data inside the cell. In this case, we might interpolate, but we might not. We might just use the value at the center. Right. But it's really just the same thing, but the grid is shifted over by a half of the unit in both cases, in, in the bottom case. Has anybody heard this word before, interpolation? We're going to use this word a lot in the next few lectures. Nobody's ever heard that word before. Well, it's a good three, it's a good thing that we have a slide dedicated to this word. To interpolate means to estimate a value of a function at a point P given no function values and points that bracket P. So what does that mean? Imagine that the, the, the example I usually use is, is when you look at the weather report. Has, any, has anybody look at the weather report? I, I used to look at it, now I stopped because I already know. I, I can just use my psychic powers and I know the weather. I don't need it. But when I used to look at the weather report, does anybody wonder about the weather report, how the data is collected and then how it's presented? That is a, that is a good exercise in data visualization. So I can look up the temperature in Bridgend, right? Our favorite Welsh town. <laughs> Anybody here from Bridgend? That's a pity. How, anybody know how that works? If I look up the temperature in Bridgend, how is the temperature derived or given? Does anybody know the answer to that already? Is there a thermometer station? Is there a temperature station? That's right. There's a weather station somewhere, right? Is there a weather station everywhere? No. No. Correct. Correct. It's not possible to have weather stations everywhere. We can only have them in some places. But when you watch the weather report, you can see the temperature everywhere, right? Even though there are weather stations everywhere. So to derive the temperature everywhere, they're using something called interpolation or interpolation between the weather stations. So imagine we had a weather station in Swansea. Probably we don't. <laughs> Do we? How do you know? Nice, nice. What's your name again? Lee. Very nice. So imagine we have a weather, Lee can tell us we definitely have a weather station in Swansea. We have a weather station in Cardiff probably, and we want the temperature in bridge end. We're assuming that bridge end does not have a weather station. If the temperature in Swansea is, say, 10 degrees Celsius, and the temperature in Cardiff is 20 degrees Celsius, 
Can anybody guess the temperature in Bridge End? Does anybody know where Bridge End is? It's half. It's about halfway in between, right? So what would you guess is the temperature? Anybody want to guess? I think we should look into other factors like the geographic location, the wind. Yeah, we're we're estimating the temperature. We're not getting the actual temperature. Yeah, you would just average the two. If it's halfway in between, you take the average, right? And you get 15 degrees. Yeah, that's what inter. That is a kind of interpolation. In that case, the interpolation is halfway between the two points. So here are two points, F1 and F2. And this is the point we're trying to guess the temperature of. So we can use, there are two ways to interpolate the temperature. Well, there are more than two ways, but here are two. One is just use the temperature or the, the value of the nearest point. So here, D, the small d is less than the big d. The, the big d is the, big, is the distance between the, the two points. The small d is the distance between these two points. So nearest neighbor interpolation is just saying use the value of the nearest point that we know. So if bridge end were closer to Swansea, then the degree the temperature we, we would use is just 10 degrees. If if it's we want to use linear interpolation, we compute, we assign a weight to this value and this value. So if this value, if, if, the, if this is closer to, say, Swansea, for example, then the weight we give to Swansea is higher by a, a proportion, which is D minus D over D. Capital D minus lowercase d over capital D. And the other weight is lowercase d over uppercase d, right? the small distance of divided by the, the large distance or the total distance. So if we were doing, for example, Neath, and Neath is only 10% of the way towards bridge end, then the weight given to the Swansea value would be 100% minus 10%, which is 90%. So 90% weight here, plus 10% of the value at Cardiff. And that's a linear interpolation of the temperature, or, or, or any point. Does that make sense? So it's you, another way of saying it is using terminology that you've heard already is weighted average. So it's a weighted average. A, a, a non-weighted average or a, a straight average is you just add the numbers up and you divide by the number of numbers. In the weighted average, each term has a in importance or a weight like 90%, 10%, and so on. <coughs> so this is just an example. When I plug in numbers, so that's the general formulation at the top. This is where I plug in numbers like temperature, there's a temperature at the first point, an unknown point, and a second point. And here I plug in 100 degrees Celsius, and then 200 degrees Celsius. And this distance is 2, and this distance is 10 minus 2, or 8. If I use nearest neighbor interpolation, then I just find the nearest neighbor, the shortest distance, and I use that value, which is 100 degrees. If I use linear interpolation, it's 100 degrees times the weight, which is 10 minus 2, or divided by 10, that's 80 percent, plus 200 degrees times 2, two divided by 10, or 20 percent. So 100 degrees times 80 percent plus 200 degrees 
times 20 percent and I get a value of 120. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense because we're going to use the term interpolation a lot for the next few lectures. And it's everywhere. This is always being used everywhere. When you watch the weather report, that is how you get a complete picture of everything. The, the temperature all across the UK, for example. Even though there's a finite number of weather stations. Does that make sense? I still remember learning this, by the way. Does anybody know, just as a side note, does anybody know what extrapolation is? I still remember the professor that asked me this question. Anybody heard the term extrapolation? Extrapolate something? I remember, like, the, the professor that asked me this, physics professor back in the US, you don't know what extrapolation is? <laughs> I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> extrapolation is, a, is estimating a value that's above, beyond the bounds of the known values. So we have two values here, but we could estimate the temperature at Bristol, for example, if we wanted to using the same techniques, nearest neighbor interpolation or linear, or let's say extrapolation, nearest neighbor extrapolation and linear extrapolation. But that's, we won't worry about that in this module. Just try to remember interpolation. That was in one dimension, the interpolation along one axis. This is what the formula looks like for three dimensions. And this is the first test question. We cite and write down the formula for linear interpolation in three dimensions. That's the first test question. Everybody's full of energy today. Oh. No, it's not the first test question. However, you won't be asked to recall any formulas on a test. However, you might be given a formula and then you have to do something with it. Like you have to know what it is and evaluate it, maybe. Right. So if you saw this formula on the test, you, you would be able to at least recognize what it is. Right. So trilinear, that's called trilinear interpolation because we're doing linear interpolation three times. So it, it depends, it's pretty arbitrary, but we can do linear interpolation along x, one, two, three, four. And then we can do two more interpolations along, along y, so <clears throat> one, two, three, four, and then along z. So it's, it's combining all those together, those, those interpolations together. So we have two kinds of interpolation so far, nearest neighbor interpolation and trilinear interpolation. Anybody want to guess why we might have two versions so far? Mm -hmm. It's Wang. Yeah? I am not good with names, especially Chinese names. So you're the first Chinese name I've ever remembered in my entire life. Yeah. So yeah, one is efficient, one is fast, this is fast, right? But low quality or lower quality, this is more computationally expensive and higher quality. There's always this trade-off between quality and speed, right? There's always that trade-off. 
you know, if you want higher accuracy or higher quality, you have to, to, to take more time. That's why I'm so slow with these lectures, because they're such high quality. <laughs> So that's some preliminary, we, we, we mix sort of content and terminology up in the volume visualization part of the module. So we just went through some terminology, right, like voxel and interpolation and, and cell, <coughs> tetrahedra, and now we're going to look at something called the conceptual volume visualization framework. <coughs> And this is, we're going to look at some algorithms in the next lectures. And the algorithms all fit inside of this picture somewhere, inside of this framework. Right? And remember, we're taking 3D data and we're projecting it onto a 2D screen. And there are lots of different ways to do that. And they all fit inside of this framework. So on one side, we start with sample data which is measured, that's just like the, the, the data from a CT scanner or weather stations or an MRI scanner or an ultrasound. Then we take the sample data and we re represent it in box of space on those little cubes, right? And those are discrete, that means there are, there are samples with spaces in between them. From there, we can do something called volume rendering, direct volume rendering, and we, this is the projection from 3D onto 2D. So we go from voxel, which is 3D, to pixel, which is 2D, right? 3D to 2D space. Or we can convert these voxels to geometric surface surfaces, which are also in 3D, and then project those surfaces to 2D. And we can go the other direction. This is analytical data. So that's data that's given by a formula, an analytical formula, and or modeling, another way of putting that. We can generate surfaces from that data, or we can convert it to sample data and then project it onto to be space. Right? If, we, if we take it from a continuous representation to a discrete representation, then it's called voxelization. And this is a very abstract right now, but it's all going to be clear. Try to remember this, well, in some ways when we're going over the, there are algorithms that do these things. One of the lectures is the algorithm on how to do this, right? And then we have other lectures. We have other lectures on just this, this stage from here to here, right? So mo that's mostly what the next lectures are about, going from here to here to here, and then going down this way. In assignment two, you do all of these things. You, you start with measured data, you, you can represent it as voxels and then perform direct volume rendering. And then there's another data set that's analytical, and you can go down this path if you want to, or you can go down that path. So. Yes, and in assignment two, you can go down this path too. Does this remind anybody of anything? This is a difficult question, by the way. You're really like a data viz person if you know the answer to this question. Does this slide remind you of anything that you've already seen in this module? Say it again. The process of visualization by the VIS pipeline. The VIS pipeline, very good, Lisa, very good. It is a special case of the visualization pipeline. Mm -hmm. or it's, 
it's the visualization pipeline in the context of volume, volume rendering or volume visualization. Remember the visualization pipeline, it's a data, data start with acquire, data acquisition, data enhancement, then visualization mapping, and then rendering. Well, here's the data, and we, there's no enhancement phase in this, in this framework, but this is the visualization mapping, and then the rendering from 2D to 3D, same on both sides. So it's a special case of the Viz pipeline. And here are some examples, so it's not so abstract and mysterious. Well, it still is a little bit abstract and mysterious, but here are some examples that, so you can see, see what we're talking about. So this is this computational tomography. Right from there, we can compute an ISO stack, so three-dimensional volume data where the number of samples along each axis is the same. For example, 256 cubed or 512 cubed. Right, sample data, then we represent that as a set of voxels. That's what this is. And then we extract surfaces from those voxels using some special algorithm. And then we project the surfaces from 3D to 2D, and that's called surface rendering. And that's what this is. This is a set of surfaces. So there's a surface that represents the skin, a surface that represents the bone, and then some soft tissue inside. So there are at least three surfaces. That's one example of going through the volume visualization framework. Here's another example. The input data is MRI data. Again, we represent it with a, a 256 cubed set of samples. And then we do something called maximum intensity projection, which instead of creating a surface, we just project a subset of the data directly onto space, onto the screen space. And we're going to talk about what that is more in the lectures. And this is, a, this is the kind of image you can generate using that, looking at the blood vessels in the hand, for example. It's perfect image for Halloween. Here's another example along the other side of the framework. So starting with a model like a potential function, we can generate surfaces from that function and then project the surfaces onto the 2D display. So that's what that looks like. So that's the conceptual volume viz framework. You could also call it like the volume visualization pipeline. That might be a better name for it, actually. So we'll, well, now we're, we're talking about the techniques, the different volume visualization techniques. And we're going to introduce some more terms. There's so-called indirect techniques, right? And these are, that means we don't look at the data samples directly, but we look at interpolated samples. So we look at the data at bridge end, for example, <coughs> instead of the data directly at the weather stations. And one's called slicing. So slicing, you can imagine, you, you saw that in the last lecture, right? You can just take a 2D slice through a 3D volume. You saw that in the video in the last lecture. And that's called an indirect method because we, we see the, the we don't see the samples directly, the data samples. And then there are so-called surface fitting methods, and those are specialized in extracting surfaces from the volume. 
but the input is the training volume, and the output is a, a surface, a 2.5D surface. And we're going to talk about an algorithm to do that called marching cubes. And then there's direct volume visualization, right? Indirect, indirect. And there, we don't have any intermediate representation of the data. We just project it from 3D to 2D. And there are different algorithms for, for doing that. We're going to talk about these two, these two. We're going to leave out these two, actually. And then there are so-called image order versus object order techniques. So that's a way to divide up the algorithms into different styles or categories or classifications. Image order means that the algorithm proceeds through all the data in a for loop in both cases. The algorithm is processed in a for loop. That's what these fours are or do. In one case, there's an algorithm that traverses every pixel in the image plane, one pixel at a time. For every pixel, do something, and then compute some, basically it's compute the red, green, and blue, and alpha values of each pixel. And there are object order algorithms which traverse the data in the 3D space. So starting from the top left to right, and then moving backwards, for example. And then computing some the RGB values and alpha values of every sample in 3D space. And we're going to look at examples of these techniques, ones that traverse image space, pixel by pixel, and ones that traverse object space, which is data sample by data sample in 3D. That would be a good note to make, by the way. 2D, two-dimensional traversal, and three-dimensional traversal. That's what that image space and object space mean. Or image order and object order. Any questions about that so far? It's a little bit abstract so far, isn't it? I, I'm using my psychic powers now, yeah, picking up waves. And I, I hear somebody thinking like, oh, I can't wait to see the algorithms that do these things. Like, it's going to be so cool. <laughs> like, how does that, that, that ultrasound machine work? Or how, how does that MRI machine extract images of my... In, insides, like Superman with X-ray vision. How does that work? That's the, some of the voices I'm hearing in the, in the collective psyche. So this is a picture that tries to put into images what I just said in words, image order approach. So this, this image is the screen, right? that we're looking at, we're sitting behind a screen, like this, this screen right here, for example. And these are pixels, and then each pixel has a, a red, green, blue value, right? Because those are the three primary colors coming from the display. And we're computing the RGB values of each pixel in a, like, from, from in a row-wise fashion or rasterized fashion. And in this case, it's, this is a picture of something called ray casting, which is shooting a ray into the volume data and then using that information along the ray to generate RGB values for each pixel. And we're going to talk about that, how that could work in a special lecture. Ray casting. And this is an object order picture, so to speak. 
and that's traversing the volume in the 3D space one cell at a time, and then projecting that the data to 2D. That's called object order rendering. We're going to talk a little bit about that too. But those are pictures of that image order and object order terminology. So, we're getting close to the end. So one of the ways we can, one of the volume visualization techniques we can use is given a 3D volume, just take a slice through it and look at what's at, on the slice. And that, that's actually part of assignment two, by the way. Has anyone heard, ever heard of the Visible Human Project? So the Visible Human Project a, a, a male and a female, I don't remember who they are, but donated their bodies to science. So that after they passed away, they signed some special paperwork and said, you may use my body to advance the knowledge of science. And what they did was they sliced the bodies, literally, like cut them, took a picture, save the picture, then move the, the blade over by a millimeter, cut them again, took a photo, and did that a thousand or two thousand times along the length of the body. That's slicing. <laughs> that's literally slicing. That's, that's like slicing in the real world. We're not talking about real slicing, we're talking about virtual slicing like moving a software slice through the 3D data. But you can see that, you can Google the Visible Human Project and see, see that. So, so there are different kinds of slices, axis aligned slices and, and non-axis aligned slices, right? So this is, an idea, this is an example of a slice through a 3D volume. So this orange plane is a slice. That's the other way. Somebody tried to scare us. It didn't work. So that's a 3D volume, and that's a 2D slice. And that's one way to visualize what's happening in a 3D volume. Does anybody want to guess what this is? What's actually happening in that image? Anybody guess? It does look like music, doesn't it? It's, I don't think there's any sound. So this is a cylinder right here. And the, the, the volume data in this case is fluid flow moving past the cylinder. So the, the user has taken a slice through the volume and then projected the velocity magnitude onto the volume. So that's how fast the, vol the, the fluid is moving. So here it's moving very slow, and there it's a little bit quicker, and here it's the quickest. And you can see the color coding on the, on the, the, the cylinder as well, and these are streamlines. One, two, three, four, five, five streamlines. Yeah, so we like to staff. That's what that is, that's slicing in action. And we saw slicing in action, by the way, in the last lecture, that mixture of virtual reality with volume visualization. You could see in, the, in that video, somebody taking a clipping aboard and, and moving it through the volume. Here's another example I'm gonna show Hopefully, a video, maybe. Oh, here's, here's an example. Actually, let's do that at the end. Well, maybe, well, maybe not. Maybe we'll just do it quickly. This is an example. Uh, 
of volume visualization. So this is this is a good another good example for Halloween. So right now the user is using different transfer functions, which we're going to talk about in the in the next lectures to visualize. That's volume data, the the, the data inside the the head, the soft tissue inside the head, right? The, the user has divided it up or classified it into gray matter and white matter. Two, two different <coughs> classifications. Right? And there's the user slicing through the, through the volume to see the interior. And then changing the colors of the different the user can change the colors of the different matter and the opacity, so how transparent the two different tissues are. Right? And so this is also what you do for assignment two, by the way. Very exciting, isn't it? And this is what this is what doctors can do. Most doctors don't do this right now, but most doctors look at just the 2D slices. You know, they hang the 2D slices on the wall. But this is a possibility. They could be doing this if the technology was a little bit more mature. And there are people working full time on bringing this technology into the hospital. There are companies that are working on that. But doctors are so busy. Right? They're so busy, they don't really have time to, to learn the new stuff. And that's an example of slicing through the volume to see the inside of the, the brain. It's nice, isn't it? It's nice to see some, some action rather than just some slides. There's a copy of that video on Blackboard. It's really beautiful. And then, before we jump into the smooth volume rendering, we'll look at the sort of the precursor to direct volume rendering, which is the, this Q world. This is the precursor. So that's the teapot, everybody's favorite teapot. If you try to represent it as just large cubes, that's what the surface looks like. So you can see the individual cubes or the voxels that that teapot is, is made of. So that's the first attempt at volume, direct volume rendering. So the only thing that's changing over time is the voxels are getting smaller and smaller until it looks like a smooth surface. And the transparency is changing. So we're modifying the transparency. That video we just saw is, is this, but with voxels that are very small and whose opacity is changing. And it's the same thing with this screen, by the way, right? Every, anybody ever take out like a magnifying glass and just stare at the screen? You can see square pixels if you zoom in close enough. So that's this, this smoothness is really an illusion. If we zoom in close enough, I can see it right now, actually. I can see the, the pixels on this display are quite big. And I can see that this is a sharp corner. You can't see that because you're too far away. But I can see that. <laughs> and those sharp corners, so I can see sharp corners and some of these, like the letter D, that's called aliasing. So it's supposed to be a smooth curve, the D, but the sharp edges are resulting from the, the inaccurate approximation of those smooth curves. And that's called aliasing. And then we have a set of techniques that are used to create the illusion of smoothness 
and that's called anti-aliasing. It creates smooth edges. If anybody wants to see those artifacts, they're welcome to do so at the end of the, the class. And I'll just show one example of the uh, so are there any questions? Happy Halloween. Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs>